Done? Okay, thank you. Okay, so to begin with, I have no financial conflicts of disclosure to uh, reveal. So the objectives. Why delay cord clamping at all? Now, maybe that's a question that seems obvious. Um, you know, we've been delaying cord clamping or deferring cord clamping as uh, the more common terminology or the more recent terminology has become for some time. A question that really comes up, and I, and I think I'm glad I'm here with Yaya because Yaya may remember in Winnipeg, we introduced cord clamping and said it should be for a minute. I remember one time Yaya was very ahead of his time. Uh, Yaya wanted to clamp for two minutes. And I remember saying, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I've seen the evidence. We're not there yet, but he wanted to get there. And it's funny because we pretty much have gotten there. And, be, and here I am talking about something even past uh, two minutes, as you'll soon see. So then the next thing is we're going to discuss what is physiological cord clamping, because that's really something that I think you're going to hear a lot about in the next few years. And then why might it be better? Um, so I was overjoyed to see a dog in the previous uh, presentation, and I thought, wow, we're going to keep it going. And because the last speaker couldn't connect, and I really hope and pray that he can, because I'm looking forward to the talk, maybe there'll be a dog in that one as well. But what is natural? Because when you think about it, in the animal kingdom, th they defer cord clamping, right? There's no timer, no, there's no dog or elephant that has a watch on and says, okay, it's time to chew off that cord. No, they, it generally stops pulsing and pulsating and, and then the, uh, the, it's separated. And when you look at, you know, even depictions in, in art, uh, this mother unfortunately didn't make it, but uh, that's what the painting's about. But um, back, you know, in, in ancient history, well, I don't know how ancient this is, but hundreds of years ago, clamping was different. There was no rush to clamp. But so why did we start cutting early? So this is a graph that I think no one will be surprised at. This is the estimated global births and you can go back towards the 18, it goes back to 1800 and you can see, and we know there's population overcrowding and so forth, but you can see that the population was rising rapidly. So when you think about why did clamping start so early, and I, I trust many of you will say you already know the answer, this was a modern obstetrical intervention. Okay, you had multiple deliveries. And now I come from a city of about 800,000 people. When you're in, I don't know what the, somebody told me the population of Dubai is 8 million or something. Is that true? That seemed rather large. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's much larger, I think, than Winnipeg, or at least maybe it seems. Or let's go with Mexico City. Mexico City has, what, 25 million people or something like that. When you've got that many people, that many births, the obstetricians simply had to go around cutting the cords early because they had to go from one place to the next. They couldn't wait for, the, for things to separate. So there's a bit of a logical fallacy there that becomes we're clamping early because we're going from one place to the other, and we assume that that's okay. okay? And now uh, I presume this audience is very well educated. You understand that that, that assumption probably isn't fair. Okay, and we have some evidence to support that. So what is delayed? And I, as I say this, I, I can already think of my co-author for the CPS, uh, Canadian Pediatric Society statement. Uh, Sarah and I authored it together along with some other people. Um, I can already hear her slapping my wrist and saying, stop saying delayed. Delayed, the reason, uh, for those of you who don't know, the reason why delayed has fallen out of is because um, delay implies that you should have been doing something right? And you were lazy, right? You delayed. Whereas deferred is more of an intentional thing. You're deferring the clamping, okay? But so wherever you see delayed, and I'm slapping my wrist myself, uh, just replacing your brain deferred. So generally, it's, it's a length at least beyond 30 seconds after delivery. It's very between one and three minutes for most of the literature that is out there. And again, yeah, yeah, you were ahead of your time when you were saying two. You were right. I finally admit it. Right. Okay. Anyway, actually, maybe you were wrong. Maybe it should have been even longer, as we'll soon see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I won't be at 10 minutes yet, but you'll see. Anyway, so growing evidence that longer is better. Okay. So why delay the first plan? Um, so as I mentioned, um, 
you know, I had the great pleasure of working with Sarah. Uh, Sarah is an obstetrician in uh, Hamilton, uh, Canada, uh, McMaster, uh, and really is a she is really uh, well articulated. And if I would definitely really be giving the talk because she really was the driving force behind umbilical cord management and preterm and term infants. And so we'll, we'll summarize the statement in a little while, but this, this statement actually, uh, I don't know what it's like over here, but it took an incredible amount of coordination because Sarah was with the Society of Obstetrics and Pathology of Canada. I, she was uh, the author from there. I was the, uh, and still am, the chair of the Fetus and Newborn Committee. And to those two organizations published together was very dif difficult, but we managed to do it. So this was co-released by the two organizations. So to summarize a, a little bit of what, what we know about cord clamping, uh, the benefits of long term, and again, you should, many of you will know this, but increased eye for six months may lead to less anemia, but also we have that mental transfusion, so less early anemia. If clamping longer than one minute, um, this may increase the risk of hyperbilirubinemia, anemia, which is not surprising. Um, you know, the bigger blood volume, the greater uh, the risk of hyperbilirubinemia, but less anemia. Now, if you were in a place where, like where I live, we have we have um, a significant problem with um, our indigenous populations in the north of Manitoba, uh, which are. It's dark for much of the year. Um, there's less nutrition, so we have vitamin D problems. We've got problems with uh, anemia. We have problems with proper nutrition, so we have a lot of milk consumption early, less breastfeeding, which leads to less iron stores. So deferring cord clamping could be of great them and perhaps other populations that are similar. Now, what about if you're preterm? To that, I look at the Cochrane Review, which is generally looked at early cord clamping, generally defined as less than two seconds two uh, times somewhere between 30 seconds to 180 seconds. This is the Cochran Review from 2019, um, used 30 to 60 seconds as the range. Um, and thankfully they referred, this is not my terminology of delayed cord clamping, but they referred, um, um, they, they looked at 25 studies with 3,100 babies, which is actually not too bad. You know, and for neonatology, I mean, when you look at adult cardiology studies in the tens of thousands, I mean, that's a big study. But uh, if we can get 3,000 patients together for neonatology, that's not bad. Uh, the outcome is tiny, so I'm going to read them to you. Uh, is that my 25 minutes? But if we look at, these are for preterm infant. Between seconds to 180 seconds leads to a reduction in the relative risk for death of babies, which is obviously a very, very important outcome. The other one that's statistically significant is any IV. Now, when you look at severe IV, that crosses that threshold of one, so we don't see a, a statistical reduction in that, but any IVH will be reduced. And I would argue the real important one there is death. Now, what about the CPS? So when the, when Sarah, myself, and others reviewed all the literature on this, uh, and, and I'd like to say we did, a, I think, a fairly exhaustive uh, search of the literature, what we concluded, this is different than the Cochrane, this is the Canadian Pediatric Society, we agreed that there was a decrease in IVH. We also found that there was a decrease in necrotizing enterocolitis, which is obviously a very important uh, outcome. Um, we also identified that there's an increase in the mean arterial pressure, uh, blood pressure, um, decreased need for blood transfusions, particularly in the preterm infant, and decreased inotropic support. Um, and as I think about, you know, as I think about my career in neonatology, uh, which now is, it's almost 25 years already, it's hard to believe, but um, when, you, when you think about it, I recall, and I'm sure many of you who have been in the field for a long time, I'm looking at yourself as well, having trained in Winnipeg, we used to start dopamine, dibutamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine all the time, you know, on these little babies, okay? And I seldom anymore am starting these medications on, on, on newborns. Yeah, and I think in large part, it's because of that deferred cord clamping. So I think this is an example where what we see from the research 
really translates into our clinical experience. Okay, so I think that that's very. So I put here a little light bulb with a good idea because I think that this is very important point to understand that one. All right, now on to physiological base cord clamping. Um, I guess uh, you know. I was worried about going much beyond a minute or a minute and a half. Because what we think about is, we think about this poor baby over here who needs to be resuscitated. It's our instinct. We want to resuscitate the baby, right? And so you better cut that cord and bring the baby over and start your ventilation and chest compressions if needed. But maybe there's another way. And so when I started to read about this as part of the Canadian Pediatric Society statement, I started to realize, you know, there's some research here that has some important lessons that we can all take as to why maybe deferring longer and maybe even resuscitating while the baby is still on the cord is the way we need to go. Now, we all know that about 10% of the, of the um, cardiac output goes through the lungs in the fetal state. Okay? After birth, we know that as air enters the lung and the lung expands, we see a drop in PVR and blood flow to the lung improves. The question is, what happens if you clamp that cord before the pulmonary blood flow has increased. Okay. So you've got oxygen to the blood coming through the umbilical vein, perfusing the cornea. If you, if you suddenly cut that cord, what is that going to do to coronary blood flow? What is that going to do to oxygenation if the lungs are not yet ready to receive blood and oxygenate? As you might expect, that can lead to bradycardia. Okay, And so, um, I'm not, not sure which, whether this is a southern hemisphere swirl or a northern hemisphere swirl, but as the water goes down the toilet one way or the other, um, I, it's, it's like you're going down the drain. So you cut the cord, and then what happens is you get this loop, okay, where um, you get with decreased ventilation and, or even a drop in PaO2, that leads to bradycardia. That leads to a decreased arterial blood pressure, leads to decreased cerebral blood flow, leads to more CNS hypoxia, which it just goes around and around and around. So if you cut too early, that's the problem, is that you can enter a loop where the hypoxia, the acidosis gets worse and worse, and it just goes in a continual loop. So the idea of physiological based cord clamping came actually from, I think, I, I hope I'm not incorrect and somebody's going to jump out and say you're wrong, but in, in essence, it came from this study which looked at umbilical cord milking, but also physiological based cord in sheep. Excuse me, out of Australia, 126 days sensation rate poodle lamb, and they were able to do something that we can't do in clinical studies. They were able to take pulmonary blood flow catheters, measure pulmonary blood flow, measure systemic blood flow. And what they found was something very interesting. What they found, and this is on the left, this is one, the study is very uh, detailed. And so I, many, many, many graphs. Demonstrate PBCC. So on the left, what you're seeing is they would start resuscitating these fetal lamps. And you could see you don't get on the, on the y-axis is mils per kilo per minute in measured pulmonary blood flow. You actually don't get significant pulmonary blood flow until after that two to two and a half minutes. Okay? Um, secondly, on the right there, you're seeing a whole bunch of different curves. It's a bit of a mess. But the one that I want you to pay attention to um, is the red one over here, the top one. Basically, what, what that's showing is that when you do PBCC and you compare that to umbilical cord milking, the um, SCTO2 is the cerebral perfusion or, or cerebral oxygenation, sorry. And what you're seeing is you get the smallest change with resuscitating with an intact cord, even compared to early clamping, even compared to umbilical cord milking. Um, the, in the Netherlands, this is where the center of all this research is. This is what the pilot study, a clinical study by uh, Brouwer from 2019, and they built the Concord. The Concord, for those of you who don't know, this was a resuscitation table meant to be able to allow physiological base baby. A um, bit cumbersome. I was amazed, for the women in the audience, I'm amazed that women would have agreed to this, but right after birth, they asked the woman to lift her left leg, okay, and they would slide the Concord in, and then she could put her leg back down. I would imagine many women would be quite exhausted after giving birth, and the idea to ask them to lift their leg was something, but 
Many women agreed to do this. There were 82 mothers and 37 preemies um, who agreed to do this. And they clamped the cord after the following three criteria were met. Adequate breathing, they had a mask that allowed uh, for measurement of exhaled uh, volume. So once they had over four mils per kilo, a heart rate over 100, and a SAT greater than the 25th percentile using uh, by minute, uh, using an oxygen less than 40%. The results, mean time of cord clamping. So in order to get that stability, they defined a stability transition after birth, was four minutes and 23 seconds. A low of three minutes to a high of 5.11, a little short of 10 minutes, but um, still quite a bit longer than we're currently doing. So what this is meaning is you weren't actually stable. Now, they didn't have pulmonary blood flow caps or, or flow probes, but they were able to tell that these patients were only one patient was cut down. Many of these patients were only cut down. So when you cut these babies out for four minutes, about 50% of them had an admission temperature. Um, the same group, Ronnie Knoll, Emma Brower was the second author. She was the first author before. What they decided to do is let's expand. Let's early cord clamping, phase cord clamping. And so what they did was um, they compared now um, 30 to 60 seconds. So they didn't go with early cord clamping because they said ethically no one's doing early cord clamping, so we should compare it to deferred cord clamping of 30 to 60 not be crossed, and you'll see in a moment what they found. Primary outcome was very similar to the previous one. They said you had to have regular spontaneous breathing. So they switched it up a little bit. They got rid of the mask exhaled um, uh, volumes in favor of the baby had to be spontaneous. Breathing. They had to have a heart rate greater than or equal to 100, and they needed a saturation above 90% with an FiO2 less than 40%. I like this outcome better because, to be honest with you, who could remember what the 25th percentile was at any given minute? <laughs> so they, they just said, let's make it more practical. Uh, and in the PBCC arm, they clamped when all criteria were met. The trial was stopped. Um, they, it was, as many trials, poor recruitment. So they stopped due to but they had enough babies that they were able to do an active analysis, and lo and behold, they found that they had already reached the end point. They were able to show that even if they had added more babies, it was not going to change the outcome. Deferred cord clamping of 30 to 60 seconds was not, um, was not uh, deemed to be non-inferior. So in other words, PBCC was found to be superior. The mean time to stabilization was 5.54 minutes in the PBCC group, and it was 7.07 .07 in the uh, deferred. And so just a couple more, or I think about three more slides. Um, one thing that was noted here, and this what comes up in the CPS statement, and this is an example of statistical difference, which maybe isn't clinically, clinically different. The CPS statement does talk about the fact that cord pH is lower in those who get PBCC, um, but when you look at the data from this, this study, and this is where it comes from, cord pH was 7.21 in the PBC group, and it's 7.29 in the deferred cord clamping group. So clinic, uh, clinically, I would argue, really not that significant, but statistically significant. The other thing that's interesting is you're more likely, and this has been replicated in other studies as well, more likely to get prolonged head if you're under PBCC if you don't get it at all, um, if, if you're uh, clamping late. So what's coming, um, the re I said at the beginning that this was going to be something that you're going to hear more about. Um, there's two studies. I won't go into detail due to time. I realize I, I need to wrap up. But um, the, um, one of them is called the SAVE study coming up, S-A-V-E. The other one is the ABC trial. Now, interestingly, it's ABC3 trial. ABC1 was the Brower trial. ABC2 was um, the Ronnie Knoll trial. This is now ABC3. So they've tried, it's like a story that they keep building. Um, and what they're going to be doing, you know, in these is really looking at, again, the use of CARTs, prolonged resuscitation, and build on the evidence. So I expect we'll have a um, Cochrane review before long on that. Um, 
this must be something that is going to take because there are companies now producing the life start um, and the baby saver are two different um, two different products that are on the market or coming to market I don't know if they're commercially available everywhere yet but the baby saver in particular if I was to ask you just look at these and say which one's more expensive you're going to say the, the fancy one on the left uh, and the right the one on the right the baby saver Really, finally, before we get to our conclusion, these are the things that we don't know yet. So we have short-term outcome things that we are looking at, like cord pHs, temperatures, and whatnot. But at the end of the day, will PBCC be superior when it comes to things like necrotized enterocolitis, jaundice, anemia, IVH, blood pressure, van? to delaying, and so in other words, will Yaya be correct? That, that's really the question. Will it be two minutes, will it be three minutes or more? The CPS position statement, um, this is ultimately what we said in summary, um, and I'll just summarize it briefly by saying, uh, we basically said that yes, PBCC is, is being done, yes, there are some studies, but we still need some more evidence. We are concerned about the hypothermia risk, because hypothermia also carries its own risk. We are concerned as well that the PBCC virtually 100%. So that's that's another question of are you going to increase the risk of pernicious blood plague if it goes unrecognized? So th that's something that needs to be done. So in conclusion, early cord clamping, while convenient, has its disadvantages. Deferred cord clamping is better at achieving both short and long-term outcomes compared to early cord clamping. But the, we still have work to be done to determine if we're ready. So, so. Okay, thank you.